Let's look at an underappreciated but incredibly important piece of medieval armour. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So, it's not the helmet for once, I've talked a lot about helmets in the past, but a piece of armour which really needs to get more attention, although it is starting to in recent times I notice, is this. Now, what is it? So, quite simply, it is what some of you might describe as a chain mail collar. First of all, we don't like the term chain mail, we should call it mail. Secondly, this is more correctly referred to as a standard. Now, it is a collar, nevertheless. Okay, now there are a few interesting things about this. This incidentally is an example made by the company uh, Kappa Pi, as you would spell it. Uh, I won't try and do the French pronunciation. Um, and I'll stick a link to them below, but this is, this is one of their collars. It's one of their standard collars. And um, this is one I've actually adapted slightly, and you'll notice it buckles at the rear. So it's got two buckles at the rear and it overlaps. And this is a really important part of my personal armour. Now, all armours are slightly different and it might be more or less important depending on what type of armour you're particularly wearing. But why is this particularly important to me? Well, first of all, it goes for me underneath my cuirass or breastplate, if you want to call it that, the upper part of my breastplate. And that means that the straps and the, the plate all rest on top of this. That Therefore, this helps to position the cuirass where it should be for me personally and where all the straps and the holes and everything are uh, correctly done to account for this added little bit of thickness of mail which goes underneath it. Secondly, it helps protect me, to some degree, from the armour. Um, now, some people might say, well, if you've got perfectly fitted armour, you shouldn't have any problems with your collarbones or anything else, your breastbone, anything else. However, the fact is not all armour is necessarily perfectly fitted. My armour was actually made for someone else who's a very similar body shape and size to me. Um, and that would have been true in period as well. So not everyone in the 15th century would have had armour 100% uh, made bespoke for them. And sometimes your armour gets a bit wrong. Sometimes you do have armour made for you, but it still chafes here, chafes there, rubs, whatever. Um, or indeed, if you're you know, hit at the front by a lance or a poleaxe or something, then sometimes you'll get some type of a bruising uh, from your armour underneath. It'll save your life, but you'll get bruising. Um, so this male collar essentially helps to protect you slightly from the armour that's up close around your neck, your collarbones, all this kind of stuff. Now I'd actually, I can wear my armour without this and it's not really a big problem, but I know other people with their armours, this is really a very, very critical part of their armour. But it's not only to protect you from your armour, of course, it's also there to protect you against opponents. Now, that's kind of obvious, yeah? It's obvious that you've got a male collar here. Now, I was wearing a um, salad a second ago, and the salad is commonly worn with a bever, which is a plate defense which goes around the lower half of the face. Now, we'll talk about bevers more in a future video. They're actually more complicated than you might think, but for the purposes of this video, the important thing to recognize is that bevers weren't always worn with salads. Although salads were designed to be worn with bevers, people often didn't wear, didn't bother wearing them because of convenience, because they wanted to eat and talk more easily, more comfort, anything like this. So we know that by the uh, middle and well later part of the 15th century, and in fact into the 16th century, very often people would just go, ah, sod it, I'm not going to wear the bever, and they'd leave it off. Now at that point, the only thing protecting your neck is this male collar. Why is that important? <laughs> kind of obvious, yeah? Any time a pointy object, even a small knife, this is a sharp knife, clearly is not going to cut through a male um, collar. Okay, however, if you're not wearing this, then any type of glancing blow or anyone with a small pocket knife like that open now can cut your neck open. So it doesn't matter how much armor you've got on the rest of your body, things can ride up off your uh, breastplate. Uh, an arrow that hits you in the breastplate could shatter and you get broken bits of um, shaft flying up towards your neck, this kind of stuff. But you know, blades, swords, knives, spears, poleaxes, lances, shattered lances, anything like this coming up towards your neck. Now, this isn't as good protection as a bever. A plate bever is way better protection than this, 
But number one, this is a good last ditch defense and it's incredibly comfortable. And once you've got it on, you could wear it, you could go out shopping, you could go driving, <laughs> riding a horse, obviously not in the 15th century, but you could ride a horse, you can do anything and still keep wearing this and kind of forget that it's there. Super comfortable, it's not hot, it doesn't rub, it doesn't restrict your movement in any way whatsoever, but it protects your very, very vital um, arteries coming up your neck and your windpipe. Now you have to recognize that whether it's a modern world and you're talking about knife crime or whether it's a medieval world and you're talking about a battlefield, any damage to your neck is potentially life-threatening and not just life-threatening like in the grand scheme of things, in seconds, okay? If you get a major blood vessel cut in your leg, uh, cut in your neck there, or into your leg as it happens, but in your neck there, um, or your windpipe, you very likely are going to die in seconds. So having this here is enormously important and at what cost? But no, I mean at the cost of buying it, but once you bought it, no, no cost or detriment whatsoever. Negligible weight, no restriction to movement, um, and so absolutely wear one. Not to say that they always did. We do see images in manuscripts and even on uh, sculptures, tomb effigies, things like this. Occasionally they don't have the male standard there. There's a possible explanation for that, and one of them is that sometimes, um, and not that in infrequently, the male standard, or collar, was worn over the armour. Um, now, very often in tomb effigies, where they're like this and they're dead and they're praying, um, they don't have the bever on because you want to see the person's face. And in some cases, a bever is integral with the male collar. So you can have an integrated bever and collar. So in those cases where they've not shown the bever because they want to show the dead person's face, in some cases, the reason you don't see the male standard can be because that's been removed with the bever. In some cases, even when they're separate things, where you've got a separate bever and a separate male collar, perhaps both of them have been removed just to get a completely unadulterated view of the person's head and neck because it's a tomb effigy and you're trying to see the person and what they looked like. It's a portrait, essentially. So there's many possible reasons, but fundamentally, by and large, this is an incredibly important piece of war gear. Now, I mentioned that these could be integrated with bevers. That's another interesting thing. Very often, um, the bever will sit over the top of this male collar, and that's how I wear mine. Now, that is another aspect of how these are important, because you have a strap coming from the bever, and there can be quite a lot of leverage and rubbing, chafing, everything else. Now, if you've got the male collar on underneath, the strap from the bever and the bever itself is not going to trouble your neck, either at the back or the front, because the bever sits on the male collar. So the male collar, again, protects you from the bever and it seats the bever more securely, um, means you can do the strap up really tight because it's against the male. It's not going to sort of chafe or cut into the back of your neck with that strap because it's over the male collar. Fantastic. As mentioned, sometimes they combine the male collar with the bever. In that case, there seem to be various constructions used, but the most usual one is that the bever literally has the male riveted to the sides of it. So it doesn't have any male underneath the front of it, and then the male comes around the sides and the back. And then the, the way that you put the bever on is you put the bever on at the front, and then those straps at the back actually do up the collar, the back of the collar, and the bever all in one go. The last thing I want to talk about is um, some of the ways that these were made, some of the variations, and how they could be more effective, made more effective. Now, there's two ways we can look at effectiveness. One is protection effectiveness. Another one is comfort and maintenance. Should we put those into one category? So one is kind of general everyday considerations. The other one is when someone's actually trying to kill you. Now, the first thing to say is this is six millimeter, uh, I think dome riveted, Indian male. This isn't the best quality male around. This is the base level these days for historically correct male or vaguely historically correct, historical looking male. Um, clearly, handmade male of better material and better riveted will be more protective than this. So quite simply, if you take a standard mass produced Indian male, and you stab it, for example, you're more likely to breach this than if you have a handmade and hand riveted, obviously, um, collar 
made by a craftsman by hand, lovingly, making sure every rivet is done perfectly. In this mass-produced mail, I know there's at least two rings in this uh, mail weave where the rivets are missing. This, unfortunately, is something that happens with mass-produced Indian mail. Sometimes they forget to put a rivet here or a rivet there. So this is the... I won't say the least protective because it's better than butted mail and it's six millimeter so I'm covered in more steel than it would be if it was say eight millimeter but nevertheless this is kind of a baseline standard literally a standard the baseline of what I'd want for protection for my neck however if I was jousting competitively or I was doing a higher level of harness vector or um, you know HEMA armoured fighting uh, with metal weapons with lots of half swording or daggers or whatever and I wanted a better throat protection I I would go for a better quality of mail. What would that involve? Well, the first thing to recognize is that all of this mail is six millimeter flat, um, alternating between solid rings and riveted. In an ideal world, this would be a denser weave around here and then it doesn't need to be such a dense weave around here and it needs to fan out and spread out. So when we look at the original male standards or collars, what we find is that the section that goes around the throat and covering the jugular, covering the major veins, um, arteries, is a denser weave because it is denser, uh, thicker rather, rings. Okay, so if you make this section up here of thicker rings, then it's gonna be stronger but it's also going to stand up and be more rigid as well. Now, that might impede your movement a little bit and might make it slightly more uncomfortable, but you gain a huge amount of protection from that. So, generally speaking, a denser weave in historical male collars, just the section around here, if not the section down here, is achieved by using thicker gauge wire, um, thicker rings, essentially, woven in together so there is more metal, less gaps, okay? Because male is a big series of gaps. Um, so you're lessening the gaps, you're increasing the, the density of the weave. There is another way of doing this, which is a cheat. If you want to use these six millimeter Indian made rings today, which you can buy in bags, you can buy the rivets, you can buy the tool to do it. Um, if you want to cheat and make this a denser weave, it's not necessarily a cheat because there are some historical examples of it as well. It is historically correct, if not necessarily normal. You can do, instead of a four in one weave, you can do a six in one weave. What do I mean by that? Well, quite simply, when you make mail, aka chain mail for the modern world, you put, for each one ring, it has four rings linked into it, and then another ring links into four rings, another ring links into four rings. In some parts of Europe at some periods, and in Japan incidentally, they sometimes use a six in one weave. That is for every one ring, there are six rings connected to it. Now that, again, it lessens the gaps and brings a denser weave in here, which means that this is a more protective, it's got a, a denser, tougher, stronger weave. There's uh, fewer, or rather there's a, a greater uh, number of, strength points of links in any given surface area. But additionally, it also means that the standard now stands up stiffer and by itself. Now the final aspect, oh, there's a maintenance, right, let's just talk about maintenance for a second. Um, the uh, One of the most common problems with the male standard is sweat. Okay, so clearly sweat pours down your head, especially when you're wearing a helmet and you're fighting or you're marching or you're riding or whatever, jousting and this gets sweaty. This unfortunately is prone to rust. As it happens, I don't know where I put it now, but I have a wire brush and I was actually just cleaning this up. That's what gave me the idea to make this video because this had a few little, little bit of surface rust on it from the last time I wore it. I obviously hadn't dried it off properly. I try not to keep this too oily. I could keep it very oily and then it would never rust, but then it would put oil all over my arming doublet and it would just not feel very nice, oil, 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 oil over my neck. So I, I keep it fairly dry, just a very light dusting of oil and then I dab it off, dry it off with a towel. Uh, but if this does get rust on it, there's two relatively easy ways of cleaning it. One is putting it in some kind of tumbler or tumbling it yourself because the male will self-clean uh, because the male rolls over itself and rubs off the rust in use. But what I was just doing was just using a wire brush, typical steel brush. You could use a brass brush, but steel brush is quicker um, and it's fine to use on male. And just basically you scrub the thing uh, and it takes the surface rust off, okay? But in use, these often self-clean themselves because that's what male tends to do if you use it regularly, but it's when you put it away 
and leave it for a while that you get problems. Um, so uh, one other way that they dealt with in period with keeping these rust free was to um, basically cover the, the rings in something and one of those things can be gilding okay so you can literally gold play all of the rings and yeah ultimately that will rub off it will abrade itself but that will protect the rings um, another way is to use brass rings around the edging and so very often on these collars we see brass rings around the edges up here however having some brass rings here and there doesn't necessarily stop the iron rings or the steel rings from rusting final thing I want to mention is uh, the collar underneath. Now this one is just a strip of leather, okay? Now I know some people just have a male collar, and there's historical evidence for this, just having a dense weave male collar with nothing underneath whatsoever. So you can just have the male against your skin if it's well made, well polished, well tumbled, um, male, smooth, without any rough edges. It can sit straight against your skin and a dense weave will protect you well you don't necessarily need something underneath it. I think lots of collars did have something underneath because we see this edge up here on lots of effigies and art. We see a little line of either fabric or leather up here. Obviously, you can't tell from a picture what it's made of, but there's a line up here which suggests there's something underneath. Some people put quite a substantial padded collar underneath, uh, and this does obviously provide more protection, uh, both from the male and just in general, but my observation is it reduces mobility, increases heat, it saps up all of the sweat, and that's difficult then how do you store the male collar because you've now got a padded thing full of sweat. So I'm not a big fan of those personally, but some people do do it. But they're the three options, either nothing underneath or something very thin, like just one layer of leather, or you can go full padding, but I think I'm not a big fan of that. And I also think there's less historical evidence for that being the case. Anyway, so there we go. I'm going to wrap it up there, uh, much like my neck. <laughs> uh, but the male standard or male collar is crazy important and can be worn in any civilian environment. Often it can be worn underneath a high civilian collar. Uh, and if someone goes to slit your throat, they're not going to be able to do it very easily anyway, unless they somehow get over the top and behind it. Um, so fantastic, very useful piece of protection, very, uh, I would say important fighting or using armour, wearing armour to protect you from the armour as well as to protect you from weapons. And just in itself, the way that it's made, the different ways of buckles, I haven't gone into that in this video, but there's sometimes one buckle, sometimes two buckles, sometimes there's a hook to stop anything sagging. There's numerous different ways of constructing them, including doing the different types of weave and different densities of weave of collar. Very fascinating subject hugely in depth. The best written source, if you want to delve even deeper than this, that I know of are Toby Capwell's books on English armour, both volume one and volume two, have both got stuff about male standards in. Fascinating, fascinating topic, and I'd like to see more written and published about them in the future. I hope you found this mildly interesting at least. If you have done, please remember to click the thumbs up. If you're not subscribed, please, please do it. It means a lot to me, it makes a big difference to the channel, and it costs you nothing at all. I will see you back on the channel really soon for another video about armour, weapons, something else, who knows. Suggestions always welcome below. See you soon folks and thanks for watching. Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.